Well, good morning again. Turning your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 16 as we finish this morning our series out of 1 Corinthians entitled uh, We Are the Church. As you are turning there, again, if you are a visitor or a new member, please know that we've got a good spread for you. We'd love for you to stay. The Emmels Group is hosting this morning and uh, get to know a little bit more about us and just connect with some folks. And also, I want to remind you that starting in a couple of weeks on Wednesday night, starting Wednesday night, October 9th, I will be starting a six-week course entitled Apprenticing with Jesus, Moving from Christianity to discipleship. And so there is kind of a difference between those two, especially in the modern ways that it is translated. So we would love for you to sign up for that course. Uh, you can use the QR code in the back or in your bulletin. Again, QR code. I'm not going to explain it. Find a young person and let them sign you up. So we would have a record of you know that you're coming because we do like to feed you at six o'clock. So I'm excited about that course. Finishing first Corinthians. I, I mentioned when we started this course that I wasn't, or this teaching, this sermon series, I wasn't too excited about it. Again, because uh, 1 Corinthians is a rough book. Um, the whole book is discipline. The whole bo book is, in letter, is, is Paul correcting a church in chaos, a church in crisis that five short years after Paul had planted this church had already become so worldly um, that it becomes so divisive and, and everyone was thinking about their individual rights, their individual freedom. Sexual immorality was, of course, rampant among them. Uh, like we even talked about last week, they even began to, at least on some level, because of the way that Paul addressed it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, began to doubt a bodily resurrection. So we get to the end of the book, and, um, and I'm telling you, I've thoroughly enjoyed <laughs> it's become one of my favorite studies because nowhere else in the bible do we get a clear picture of the essence the culture the nature of the church just based upon the opposite of whatever corinth was doing but as we get to this last one we're going to deal with corinth in our own giving and generosity now preachers like me we don't like to preach on giving. Can I be honest with you? And you know why. You know why. Because of all the abuses and everything that has been done to manipulate and how throughout the course of church history, religion has gone into the business of profiteering under the name of Jesus Christ. And this, that is not a new thing. That is not a new phenomenon. That has happened throughout the course of, of religious history for 2,000 years. And so guys like me who really aren't in that prosperity preaching realm, you know what I'm talking about when I say that? And guys like me who don't necessarily believe that just because you sign up for Christianity means you get a ticket of health and wealth. In fact, sometimes the opposite might be true. So when we have to tackle passages like this, we're uncomfortable. I, I, I begin to think about always, as many times as you do, but what about our visitors, right? We always have visitors here. We always have first-time visitors here on a Sunday morning. And sure enough, the Sunday they show up, that preacher's going to preach on giving. You know, what are they going to think, you know? And so you wrestle with all of those things. So I have to ask your forgiveness. I haven't preached on giving enough. Because I have let the enemy take his manipulation and keep us from the truth of how the culture of generosity and giving has always been who we are. It's always been who the people of God. If you, if you look again, as you study church history throughout the millennial, you'll see it was the Christians, it was the church who showed up in a community time and time again in time of needs and gave of everything they had, even if they had to sell something to be able to meet the needs, sometimes of even total strangers. And so we've let the enemy doof us. I've let I've let the enemy doof me, and I'm sorry. I know I've preached on giving here and there, but it is so core to our culture. We are a generous people. 
We're made that way. It's in our, our very DNA. And so Paul deals lastly in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 through 4, which will be our reading today, with a collection that the Corinth church was taking up for their brothers in Jerusalem. So as our tradition, let's stand for the reading of the word. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 1. Now about the collection for the Lord's people. Do what I told the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of every week, each of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income, saving it up, so that when I come, no collections have to be made. Then, when I arrive, I will give you letters of introduction to the men you approve and send them with your gift to Jerusalem. If it seems advisable for me to go also, they will accompany me. May God bless the reading of his word. Have a seat. And so we have a short passage here in this particular letter. Again, multiple, multiple letters to the church in Corinth. Some of them we have, some that we don't. But in 2 Corinthians, he gives an entire two chapters to this idea of generosity and giving. And we'll dive into that a bit this morning. The historical background, again, many of you know it, but I'm going to let you know Paul was burdened with the needs of the Jerusalem Christians because of a famine. If you know the book of Acts, you know a prophet named Agabus had prophesied about this, that there was going to be a time of famine years before. We don't know how long before, but in, in advance, he started getting the Christian churches ready for what was going to happen. There was going to be a famine across the, the entirety of the Mediterranean. But you got to remember, Jerusalem was not a metropolitan area. Judea particularly was hit hard because it, wasn't, it was not a wealthy area, especially around Jerusalem. It was, it was rural. I know you think of Jerusalem as being this, this huge metropolitan area and, and a place of wealth. And, and like 900 years before this, in the time of Solomon, it was the wealthiest place on the planet. But that was not the case in first century A.D. It was poor. Jerusalem was the outcast region of the Roman Empire, especially compared to places like Corinth and Ephesus and other places like that that were the centerpieces of, of market and, and of trade and of wealth and money. Uh, Jerusalem was not equal to that. So when famine hits, when hard times hit, the poorest regions are hit the hardest, and that was true of Jerusalem. But not only because of the famine, you got to understand, a Jewish Christian becoming a Christian had certain sacrifices, one of them being persecution at a different level sometimes than even the Gentile or the Greek Christians. Because the Jews, when they became a Christian, when it was no longer popular for it to be under the umbrella of the Jewish religion, many times they were kicked out of the synagogue. The synagogue was not just a place of worship. It was the place of social interaction. It was the place where you became accepted in that Jewish community. And to be kicked out of the synagogue was not only like you getting disfellowshipped from a church. Sometimes you couldn't do business. Imagine, Kyle, your contracting business because you became a Christian. No one would hire you to do your carpentry work anymore because you no longer belong to them. This affected them in an entirely different way than sometimes even the Gentile Christians. So you take the poverty or the, or the, or the, uh, the low economic um, uh, station of Jerusalem and Judea, you couple it with the persecution, and they were the ones that were needing help. But obviously Jerusalem was the place where Christianity was born through Jesus Christ. And so Paul saw this as an incredible opportunity that yes, the gospel came from Jerusalem, but now these Gentiles, these Greeks could give back. Because Paul was always trying to bridge that gap between the Gentiles and the Jews. And now it was these more wealthy, these more uh, uh, financially stable Greeks and Gentiles in the Roman Empire who were Christians could help their Jewish Christian brothers. So that's the historical context, for, but from the beginning... This thing called Christianity has had the cultural DNA of generosity and giving. In Acts chapter 2, just shortly after 
I mean, really shortly after, uh, Pentecost and the beginning of the church, the first gospel sermon that occurred. You have this in Acts chapter 2, verse 44. All the believers were together, you know this verse, and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give anyone, to anyone who had need. Now, if you remember the context here, that all of these Jewish pilgrims had made their way to Jerusalem for the Passover, and 3,000 of them or so had been converted to Christianity. A lot of these Christians who were probably camping outside the walls in the, the Kidron Valley there between the Mount of Olives and Jerusalem, they just stayed. They didn't go, a lot of them didn't go back home. They didn't prepare to stay. They prepared to come to do the Passover, but they became Christians and they wanted that Christian community and they wanted to stay together and they knew when they went back home that they would be alone and so they stayed together. So there were all kinds of needs of of basically these pilgrims who had no homes, who had converted to Christianity. And so they had to take care of these masses and masses of people who were camping around Jerusalem. And as we look at this, this is an incredible thing. They sold property. You know what that tells me? They didn't give from their abundance. They had to sell something. I mean, there's nothing wrong with giving from abundance, but that's not what's talked about at the beginning of Christianity. They literally had to liquidate some kind of asset to take care of these brothers and sisters who were very, very new to them. What motivated them to do that? Do you know this is still happening today? I'm not going to tell you the specific instance because I'll get in trouble because the people don't want this to be known. But there was a need in this church from an individual, a personal need. And someone heard about it and sold and liquidated a personal asset to meet that need. It was one of the first times I'd seen that in Christianity. I mean, we give from abundance and prosperity and all those things, but they actually said they need this more than I need this asset, this thing. And they sold it and they met the need. And so that lets me know this DNA is still in us, right? To actually not, it says in Acts chapter 4, no one considered anything their own. And because of that mindset, it said there was And when you think about the context of how many of them there were to take care of, it says there was no need among them. This is who we are. We are a giving and generous people. That's that's one of the greatest expressions. And again, as you study church history, we were recognized by the way we loved each other first, but then we were recognized by the way that we met the needs of the community in which that church existed. Two quick insights from this short passage here in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. They gave every week, and that was both strategic and saving up. It said saving, right? Saving up for the Jerusalem contribution to take care of their brothers and sisters in the famine, but it was also a blessing to the giver to make it part of their routine of life. Because routine, listen, routine is the only thing that creates culture. Do you all have traditions in your household? Do you have Christmas traditions, Thanksgiving traditions? Do you have things that you do? What makes them a tradition? What makes them part of your culture? You do them every single year whether you like it or not, right? Right? That's routine. You can't create culture without routine. And if we are to be a a giving and generous people, people who don't believe that anything we have actually belongs to us, giving can't be sporadic it has to be a consistent part of my life it can't be sporadic or random because that just creates convenience that does not create culture and let me tell you giving is never convenient it's like well we're going to wait to have kids till it's convenient yeah, we always, as older people, always laugh at that, right? It's never convenient. And if you think it's convenient, you're wrong. It's never convenient to have children. 
But what a blessing, right? We're not about convenience. We're about creating the culture of heaven on earth. And part of that is not letting the spirit of money get its talons in us and take away from the culture of the people of God. Generosity and giving. It has to be routine. But not only does it have to be routine, um, I think we need to rethink the way we think about savings account. You know, this was particularly for this one, especially, right? This wasn't just a weekly contribution to, to meet the needs of the local congregation. Or the, this was a, a response to a specific need in Jerusalem. And Paul said, give a little bit each week. Why? So you create a savings account. I mean, it's exactly what he was telling him to do. How do you view your savings account? And maybe our mindset concerning our savings account should move from security to generosity. Because if we believe that God is our provider, right? Jehovah Jireh. That we don't have to be as concerned as the world with security. Because we have a Father who will meet all of our needs. So if that's not the primary reason to have a savings account, what is? What if? It's so you could be the generous person you were always made to be. Now, believe me, my toes got stepped on all week long (laughs) with this. I don't have a savings account for generosity. I don't. But we're changing that. And we're making moves toward that. Because... I know at the core culture of my DNA, I need to get some stewardship things in line in my own finances. Why? So that we can have a savings account. Why? So that Billy feels secure? No. So that we can be the generous people that God has called us to be. Because let me tell you, brothers and sisters, there's always a famine on the horizon. There's always a famine. And I don't have to be a prophet. (laughs) could just be a student of history for someone in this room you're going into a famine you're in a famine or you're coming out of a famine but you have lived many of you I see the gray hairs among us you've lived long enough a famine is always on the horizon and let me tell you is the church ready to be generous are you ready to be generous When a famine hits your brother and sister in Christ. Let me tell you, I have a heart. And this this not only is is a micro kind of repentance that probably needs to take place. This is a macro. Eastern Hills. We don't need to have tens of thousands of money sitting over somewhere. We need to have hundreds of thousands of dollars sitting somewhere. So that when the famine hits, Eastern Hills will be generous to whoever needs it in the body of Christ. Imagine that if we saved up, not just for projects, but the church of Jesus Christ actually saved up for people. It's time to reclaim who we are as people of giving and people of generosity people who will actually sell what they own to meet the needs of our brothers and sisters in Christ. But there wasn't just routine and savings in their giving. There was proportion in their giving. Listen, there is no flat rate to give. There's no flat rate. Just give this much, right? Everywhere we see in Scripture, there is this proportion to income. We'll talk about this more next week, but... There is this consistency that's routine in both when you give and what you give according to your income and what God has done. But as we go over into 2 Corinthians chapter 8, we see a couple of other things that we can get from this thing of, of, of maintaining and, and, and producing. Now, I, I want you to know, I, I got to give Corinth some credit. 
It seems like in everything else that we've talked about, they were desperately needing help. It seemed like of all the things, they were doing kind of okay with this one. They seem to maintain a level of generosity even with all these other issues that we've talked about. So this isn't coming at us going, oh, you need to do better or whatever. But there is a, a fire that needs to be relit under Christian culture concerning our finances. It says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 5. It says, they gave in the context of giving, by the way, that's what it's talking about of the Macedonian Christians, particularly in this context, they gave themselves first of all to the Lord and then by the will of God also to us. See, when we deal with giving, giving is about the first before it's about the amount. Okay, giving is about first before it's about amount. God has always been concerned with, are we actually going to put him first in all that we do? It's the principle of first that's woven throughout Scripture. Of course, the place that it comes home first is Genesis chapter 4, verse 3 and 5. Why did God prefer Abel's sacrifice over Cain's? Genesis chapter 4, verse 3. Now Abel kept flocks and Cain worked the soil in the course of time. Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. The first... Um, case of depression that we ever see in the Bible is, is around this situation. But why? You know, is, is it because it was soil and fruits and vegetables versus, you know, the fat of animals and all that? Again, we, they had no law back then. Again, I think I've underlined it here to let you know what I believe it is, is that Abel brought some, and Cain, I mean, Cain brought some, but Abel brought the first. And, and Abel brought the best. God does not accept leftovers as an offering. Otherwise, you are just giving to a nonprofit. That's okay. Nonprofits need money, right? But if you're going to call it an offering and you're going to say it's to God first, before it's to Eastern Hills and all the ministries, I think we do some great ministries around here, folks. I really do. I'm really proud of it. I want you to know, before I took this job, I said, I want to see the budget. Because I wanted to know where your money was going. The church's money, right? What was priority? So, so I think those things are important. But if you're going to call it an offering, it has to be to God first. And then maybe second or after that, to the ministries of Eastern Hills. God doesn't accept leftovers and he doesn't take second even to eastern hills your offering is to god and once you give that offering you've given it belongs to him okay it has to be to him first but then giving is not just about the first before it's about the amount I'm going to say something that some might not agree with. I don't believe giving is a command in the New Testament. I don't believe giving in the New Covenant. Can I, I'll say it that way. In the New Covenant, I don't believe giving is a command. Because I'm very careful with that word. Because I don't want to take away from the command that I see in the New Testament. A new command that I give you, Jesus says, love the way I love so we love God the way that Jesus loved God and we love others the way that Jesus loved others to the best of our ability so we have to be a student we have to be a disciple of him to know what that looks like sign up for the course right but but we're going to love the way that Jesus loved that's the command so it's not a command 
but it is a test. Both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, giving is associated with a test. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 8. Can we bring that up? 2 Corinthians 8, verse 8. I am not commanding you in the context of giving, but I want to test. The sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. In this case, the Macedonian giving. And so what Paul is saying here very clearly is, listen, giving has to be a choice. Now, I know you can choose to obey, but it needs to be more than that. We'll talk about being a cheerful giver next week, and we'll, we'll dive into that a little bit more. But it's got to be a choice. This particular principle of Christianity has to be your choice choice to be an offering up to God okay it but it is and it is a test are you loving God and others the way Jesus does and one way to check that out is to check your banking account why you've known this your money is gonna follow your heart always it's going to follow your heart. And this is a test to see where our sincerity, the sincerity of our love is actually out. Now, the Old Testament test is actually of God. In Matthew chapter, Malachi, I'm sorry, Malachi chapter 3, verse 8. Malachi 3, 8. Will a mere mortal rob God? Yeah, you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you? Conversation between the children of God and God. In tithes and offerings, you are under a curse, your whole nation. That's important, by the way. Hold on to that thought. Because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this. The only place I see that that happens, like this anyway. You know, it's sometimes not a great idea to test God, right? But yet, in this one specifically, it's pretty bold. In the way he says, test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will be not room enough to store it. Again, I cringe when I read the verse. I, I can't stand that when the enemy is able to do that with me because of how it's been manipulated and what religion has done over the years to fill up their own coffers, not for generosity, but for security, Right? But it's, I, think, I think one of the ways that this actually kind of takes care of itself is, again, is that word, the whole nation. nation. The blessing is not about coming individually, but communally. Yes, it does talk right after this about individual crops and individual vines actually producing more because you're faithful with the tithe and the offering. But even in that context, it's so that you can give that for the benefit of all. It, and again, in Western Christianity, we read everything be, through the lens of me and mine instead of us and y'all, right? This, this is all of us together in this room getting the rebuke or getting the blessing. This is about all of us combining our resources together so that Acts chapter 4 can actually happen in our time, that there's actually no need among us. This isn't about your own prosperity. It's not what this is about. This was about the prosperity of the nation of Israel so that, if you know the whole history of why the nation of Israel came about, so that they might be a blessing to the entire world. And that's who we are as we pick up, if you believe, we pick up that mantle of the promises of Abraham in the church today. It is our job to be a blessing to the entire world world how are we going to do that communally unless God opens the floodgates to us in every way not under compulsion of a command but a choice because this is stewardship this is not communism and there's a big difference, 
We'll talk about that next week. Because Matthew chapter 6, Matthew 6 verse 21 is still there. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where is the heart of this congregation? And I'm going to tell you by looking at the budget, I can tell you pretty easily where the heart of this church is. Is that we, we believe in teaching, we believe in, in growing and discipling, but we believe that there should be no hungry person in Henderson County. We believe that children should be taken care of in a preschool that is in the atmosphere of God. And I could go on and on and on about the priorities and where is the... It's okay for different churches to have different hearts. The budget's available in the office. You can go pick it up and anyone can look at it and you will see the heart of Eastern Hills by where we spend our money just like you can do in your own account. Where's your heart? Where's our heart? Where your treasure is. That's where it's at. Next week, we'll dive in to the mindset of the stewardship and the principle of the tithe. We'll get into that a little bit more next week. But I want to really, really hit home. This can't be a command because it robs it of its offering. This needs to be your choice. This has got to be between you and God. But yes, even though it's between you and God, this isn't an individual decision. This is communal. This is us together. You have the choice to offer your money to God or not. But I would say this. Do you control your money or does your money control you? Because I only see two avenues when it comes to finances. You're a slave to the God of mammon, money, or you're a steward to God. And we'll dive into it again that next week. But 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12, in the context of sexual immorality, but I think it fits, it says, again, they toted this, and they said this saying a lot in the church in Corinth, I have the right to do anything. Can I apply it here, even though it was sexual immorality in this particular verse? Because they repeated it all through 1 Corinthians. You have the right to do with your money the way you see fit. Sure you do. If it's yours. You absolutely have that right. But not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything with my money. But I will not. Here's Paul's rebuttal to both of those. But I will not be mastered by anything. Can I confess? The God of mammon, the God of money has been my master in my life before. I've had a business that was successful and then it very wasn't successful. And mostly through debt and probably poor stewardship on my part, I have made myself in many ways throughout my life a slave to something other than God. And can I tell you from experience, whether you have a lot of money and it's about getting more and more and more because of your own insecurity or to, to, to safeguard yourself from fear or whether you have had debt and you've always been behind the game and you've only had enough or maybe to pay the bills, maybe not. Other, each side of that is the same side, or the, it's the two sides to the same coin. You're still enslaved in both arenas. I've lived though both of those arenas before. And I'm telling you, the God of money is the worst taskmaster on the planet. He's not a good king. He's not a good master. But Jesus is. 
and there is freedom from this over emphasis consumption again we're going to talk about stewardship next week but this over emphasis and this over consumption of money am I going to have enough can I keep enough can I keep what I have and it just totally distracts our life where we don't have eyes to see and ears to hear the kingdom the Jesus that's actually in front of us and I proclaim this morning there's freedom there is freedom from that enslavement to money. There's freedom from the love, the worry, the captivity of your finances. And one of the best ways that you can overcome that is to give and to be generous. And to position yourself in the future for more and more and more generosity. Maybe not by having more and more and more. That might be the case. But by living below your means more and more and more. So that you can be the generous people. We can be the generous people. That God has called us to. Father, I pray a blessing over this room right now. I didn't, I didn't want to preach it. God, I don't want to preach it. <laughs> because I've lived it. It's hard. And I confess, for far too many years of my life, money was way more of a master over me than it should have been. But there's freedom in giving. And there's freedom and generosity. I thank you for every act of giving and generosity that is represented in this room. But as a preacher, I'm calling more. And if you choose, Father, to bless our individual vines and our individual orchards, so be it. I long for a day in Henderson County when there are no needs because the church is who the church is supposed to be. We love you. We honor you. Keep teaching us on this Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're, if you're on the prayer team, you can make your way to the prayer stations again. This is a great time. Uh, you can go up to these and, and they will pray for you. Um, you know, just saying, hey, you know, I, I could use some help in this arena a little bit. And um, there's freedom. Uh, but also, obviously, if there's a chance, and there's always a chance, there's someone in here that's never accepted Christ. It's never made a proclamation of faith. that has never believed and never trusted this thing. That'd be a weird thing if someone came to Christ with a sermon on giving. Right? I've seen it happen. You know why? People know they're made to be generous. People know they're made to give, and that's not the world. That's us. So if you want to belong to a generous place through Jesus Christ, I'll be down front. If we can help you in any way, come as we stand.